Hello viewers, uh, welcome to our part one series of uh, research methodology called BMCU001. My name is uh, Dr. Henry Yatich uh, from the School of Business and Economics taking you uh, through this presentation today. Um, allow me at this point to start by introducing you to research methodology and what that simply implies is that uh, in the field of research First of all, we have to understand the basic and fundamental definitions and more than that, also to understand the, the scope of our research methodology lesson in terms of what we are going to cover uh, for this presentation. Uh, first and foremost is that uh, we are all familiar with research, uh, whether research in academia, uh, whether research in either the field of work, in, uh, that is if you are talking about organizational setup, or whether you're talking about research, even in the political arena. And most oftenly, when we watch the news, or maybe when we read journals, or maybe publications, we come across numerous publications and presentation of research findings. And what does that imply? It simply means that uh, there are some decisions, or there are some activities that must be informed uh, through research endeavors. And be that as it be, in academia, and I'm going to restrict myself to academia, is that when we talk about research, the definition of research uh, is, uh, I would say that the definition of research is common and uh, applies to all other disciplines in terms of the process, in terms of the methods. But as we go along through this presentation and the subsequent uh, lesson chapters, you'll be more enlightened on what this entails in the field of social sciences and in business. Now, let's look at, for example, what research is in terms of a scientific process. Um, with the definition presented here, uh, I would want to simply say that it is basically a process that involves collection of data, identification of a research problem, identifying the methodologies that apply to that uh, particular method or approach you're using. And basically, once you've done that, you need to analyze that data so that you can derive meaning out of that data for the consumer of your research uh, activity. Uh, secondly, what is important is that we need to distinguish between research, research methodology, and the methods. Uh, most often, the students get confused when we talk about uh, or whether on, 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 a specific, on specific usage of these terminologies. For example, when you talk about research, then you're talking about the general uh, discipline of research in terms of the processes and in terms of the approaches and the methods involved. However, when we talk about the methodology, then we are simply referring to a scientific process. What is a scientific process? A scientific process is basically that process that involves the use of empirical data. Uh, you must have heard of conceptual papers, uh, dissertations, uh, theses, uh, research projects, and so forth. Those the findings and the final product of such a process must always adhere to a particular process which we, said, which we refer to as the scientific process. And as such, we refer to that as the research methodology. However, the different types of techniques that you apply in the process of carrying out your research activity is now what we refer to as the research methods. So what are the research methods? The research methods are basically the techniques the tools that you're going to use in that particular study so that you can arrive at the meaningful conclusion of your study. Having said that, we normally say in research that you can either be doing or be pursuing or be conducting a qualitative research, a quantitative research, or a combination of both, which we normally refer to as the mixed approach or the mixed research. Um, let's move to the second slide, and we are going to look at the elements of scientific research. Now, what are the elements of scientific research? I've given you about five key elements, but this is not exhaustive. It simply implies that this is basically a guide, even as you anticipate to commence your research concept writing, then proceeding to the research proposal, and then going to the field, and then submitting your final research output. Now, what do we mean when we talk about elements of uh, scientific research? We are simply looking at the tenets or the principles that underpin a research process. 
And the first and very important uh, principle or element of a scientific process or research for that matter is you must be very logical and systematic. Um, allow me to say that by being systematic and logical, we are saying that a scientific process demands that you go to the field, you identify, before you go to the field, you must identify a research problem. Once you identify a research problem, then now you need to refine that problem. In our next lesson, I'm going to speak more about this research problem. However, at this point, what is important for you to note is that you must be very systematic, you must be very logical. Logic sim simply implies that there must be a continuous flow. Usually in pedagogical techniques of teaching, we normally say that you start from the, no and, uh, the known to the unknown. The same concept also applies in research. You must be able to communicate to your consumer or your reader what he is aware of or what is he or she already knows. Then you move now to the unknown, and that is now when you come to the conclusion of your research and you're presenting your findings, conclusions, and recommendations. So you must be very systematic. You must be very logical in your process in terms of the flow, continuity, and synergy. Secondly, we normally say that you do not need to reinvent the wheel in research. What that simply implies is that research should be replicable and it must be transmittable. Allow me to focus on replicability of research. The replicability of research simply means that you are not going to do something new, but rather you're going to focus on maybe what other people have done. And by doing that, you're able to bring us or give us a gap or tell us, is there a gap from the previous studies that have been done and if that gap exists, in what form and what does it entail? So what you're only telling us is that you're trying to do the same thing, but focusing on either a different method, different approach, or rather you're actually looking at uh, maybe uh, a new area or a new element that maybe previous researchers did not focus on. Thirdly is that a scientific research process is reductive. Reductive means that you must reduce, you must try always to be very uh, focused, you must be very specific in terms of what you are looking at, and as you do that, then we are simply saying that you will be able to arrive at the end of your research process by ensuring that the reader who is going to read your work is able to follow your work right from the point of introduction, talking about the background, and maybe going to uh, now the point of view going to the field, from the field, come back with your data, analyze that data, and then present your findings. Fourthly, is that we always insist on provisional results. What do we mean by a scientific process being, and, or maybe adhering to the element of provisional results? What we are simply saying is that the provisional results of your findings should be able to inform further studies. And that is why most often you come to the point of making recommendation for your research and you normally say that maybe you did not focus on this particular population or you never used a particular approach and you are thinking or you are proposing that maybe future researchers or future studies of the same uh, that maybe focuses on the same discipline or area can actually look at maybe a particular approach and see whether they can come up with different types of findings or maybe arrive at the same conclusion. And least but not last is you must be very objective at every given point when you are doing your study. Objectivity means that right from the point you've identified your research problem, you need to come up with research objectives. As you identify those research objectives, then you are able now to guide your study vis-a-vis -vis those research objectives because it is the research objectives that will contain the variables of the study so that as you proceed with your study, you are able to always refer and always uh, look at the objectives in terms of the discussions you're doing in your literature review and even uh, when you're presenting your findings. Next, we are going to look at the types of research. I started in my first slide to highlight that we normally have research being distinguished into three different thematic areas. That is, you're either talking of qualitative approach, quantitative approach, or a mixed approach. Now, what about the qualities of, uh, what about the types of research then? So, we normally divide or we normally 
um, look at research types in terms of three distinct areas. One, we look at it in terms of, is it a basic or pure or fundamental research? Is it an applied research or is it an action research? I'll try to speak uh, briefly on each and every one of those distinctions. When you talk about basic research, then you are saying that you are going to the field to generate new knowledge. By generating new knowledge, you are telling us there is a gap in the field, either in terms of a theoretical foundation or either in terms of a discovery, and therefore you want to bring that knowledge to the reader or to the consumer to share with them new knowledge, new findings, and so forth. That's why we normally call it a basic or fundamental research. Then what about the applied research? Most oftenly, uh, I invite you to look at some of, or most of the publications available online or maybe even in publications. You will find that most of the research conducted today fall under the second category of applied research. Applied research simply means that you are trying to apply what is available or rather when you talk about applied research, you are simply saying that you are identifying an existing problem or an occurrence that is dynamic in nature and you are trying to find a solution for that problem. So you will find that most of the studies that are normally done either by students or maybe even in organizations or maybe research organizations fall under this category of applied research. What that also entails is that you are trying to either solve a problem in an organization, a problem affecting uh, maybe uh, a society or an entity or a phenomenon, or you're actually looking at maybe a problem existing either in, an, in a company and you're trying to find a solution or maybe a strategy that will improve that inadequacy or that inefficiency in that organization or entity. And therefore, the word applied simply means that you are applying a particular strategy to see whether you're going to get different results or maybe different findings. Then lastly is the action research. Action research is normally done in the course of a, uh, an organizational activity or uh, in the course of uh, individual occupational uh, activity. By that, I simply mean that action research is normally done in the process of working. So if, for example, you're working for a particular organization, B or A, or maybe you are a, speci uh, you're a specialist in a particular uh, let's say profession, let's say for example you are uh, uh, as a professional in sports and you want to find out maybe how best uh, athletes can perform better in the field. So when you do a research in the course of your occupation, then it becomes an action research because you are trying to identify actionable uh, points or you are trying to identify or discover new findings that will improve either a process in a production process or maybe a process, uh, let's say for example in pursuing a particular activity or event. And therefore it is limited to an organizational process or it is limited to an occupational process. So the difference between the two is that in action research you're doing it at the cost of working or maybe at the cost of performing or maybe running a particular endeavor, whereas applied research is identifying a problem in an, uh, in an existing organization or entity and trying to identify solutions or strategies to improve or maybe to remedy that. Whereas basic or uh, fundamental research uh, aims to come up with new knowledge or create new theories and maybe new discoveries. The other discussion that I want us to look at today also is what are the qualities of a good research. Most often, uh, when we invite students to go to the field or maybe to present their concept papers, uh, we always insist that your research must subscri uh, subscribe to some particular characteristics. And one of that key characteristics is that you must always be very clear in terms of your research purpose. Why are you doing that research? And kindly know that doing research is not for the purpose of graduation. Doing research is not maybe, for example, for the purpose uh, for the university to have more publication and so forth. In as much as that might be an auxiliary benefit or output, but we have to stick to the tenets and the principles of a scientific research process. So being clear in research purpose implies that the moment you've identified the problem, because as I said, 
you cannot commence any research process without a research problem. So the moment you've identified your research problem and you've identified a thematic area that that research problem falls into in terms of the research title, then you are always invited to also do a little bit of literature review. You need to go and find out either from publications or either from experts what they know or what is there that speaks to that research problem so that you are not duplicating what other people have done but rather you are trying to either create an improvement or come up maybe with a new finding and in so doing being clear uh, uh, on your research purpose means that once you have a clear research problem then you need to tell us uh, the purpose of that research why are you doing it? Are you doing it so that you can improve a process? Are you doing it so that you can come up with new cure? Let's say, for example, in terms of even like COVID-19, because people have gone to the lab and they have tried their level best to do a lot of research and come up with some uh, vaccines. So you have to be very clear in terms of the end beneficiary. So if it is a vaccine that you are trying to develop, then you should tell us that this is supposed to address this problem in terms of maybe, for example, the current pandemic. But if it is in business, then you need to tell us that maybe because organization A's performance has been on the decline for the last maybe three, four, five, or six, or 10 years, and therefore you want to identify whether this symptom or this problem is related to that performance. And therefore, that is why now, once you are clear to go to the field, you now go and gather more evidence to support your assumption. Because before you come up and make a conclusion, you need to have supporting evidence in terms of the feedback that you go and collect from the field or maybe from that organization so that you can come and now do uh, some analysis and try to uh, the arrive at the conclusion or recommendation in terms of whether that is associated with that decline in performance. Secondly, you have to be very consistent in your research. Consistency means that if you are speaking about a particular variable, let's say, for example, you are looking at incentive and its influence on organizational performance. And in this case, you're looking at performance in terms of maybe production. So you've, been, you've read the newspapers or maybe there's been this concern, maybe either from literature review, from the newspapers, or maybe from the economy itself in terms of government publication like the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics publications. So if you pick on those reports and then you sit down with them and then you do an analysis and then you realize this particular industry, let's say the banking industry, has been consistently underperforming in terms of the trends that you're going to collect. Then you may want now to find out why that has been happening. And as such, you will be now forced to go back and read more about those industries. Are there any banks that have been closed? What occasion they close here? Are there any banks that have been put uh, maybe under receivership? What are the things that occasion that in terms of the organization management and maybe uh, other influences? Then once you now realize that out of these possibilities, other researchers have dwelled on maybe six or seven of them, and maybe you have identified 10 possibilities, then you are left now with three possibilities. Then further you go and also do more reading on those possibilities so that you can be able to identify the main, uh, the main possibility that has not been addressed so that you can now go to the field and find out whether is there any relationship or association bet uh, between what has not been researched on and this consistent performance or maybe decline in performance of that particular industry. So consistency is very important in the sense that right from the background you should speak into that research problem write in your objectives, you should speak into that problem. In your literature review, we should see that problem being manifested in terms of the empirical uh, review that you're going to do. Right even in your analysis, we should see that consistency in terms of those variables that you're focusing on so that you are not at any given digressing or maybe focusing on a, di a different trajectory other than what the research objectives uh, tell you. Thirdly, is that in research also, we always insist on ethical uh, considerations. When we talk about ethical consideration, we are saying that you are dealing with human beings. That is, if you are in social sciences or business research, in uh, the health sciences, you could be dealing with animals. 
And most often, this type of data that you go and collect, you collect them from people or maybe from organizations and you'll be speaking to people. As you do that, we normally say that every research process must always adhere to some particular ethical standards or considerations. What are these ethical considerations? I know we will come to this later, but maybe just for the interest of this lesson is that when you're dealing with human beings, it's always good to seek or to always ensure that there is informed consent. You need their consent so that uh, they can participate in their study. So most often you'll find that when you go to collect data, you will ask people to, that what you are doing is voluntary, that you're not forcing them to participate in that study and they can withdraw at any given point if they feel that that uh, research process prejudices either their beliefs or maybe their thoughts or maybe their activities. That is one element of ethical considerations. Another key ethical consideration that we normally insist in research is that you must be very truthful and factual. Truthful means that when you go and review somebody's work, you must always acknowledge, you must cite that work because it is not your work. However, there's always room for you to discuss and maybe give your own side of the story in terms of whether you agree or disagree with them. Those are two elements. The other element of ethical consideration also means that you should always avoid plagiarizing other people's work. We have cases that even lead to recall of somebody's, uh, uh, that is a certificate in terms of graduations because of such kind of ethical uh, malpractices. So it is important that you must always maintain ethical standards at any given level and process. You must respect them. If you are doing research with young children, for example, who are under 18, then there are always provision of getting consent from either their parents or maybe an adult who is in charge of them. If you are doing it in animals, I think for those who are in health sciences, they are very much familiar uh, of maybe seeking for ethical clearance. We nowadays have ethical, uh, ethical clearance committees, like even at Mount Kenya University, we have an ethical review com uh, committee which will always review your work so that they can try to help you fine-tune your research instrument so that any question or any uh, maybe information that may prejudice your subject or your respondent is addressed and met it in such a manner that it will not create conflict between you, the researcher, and maybe the respondent that you're going to target out there in the field. Fourthly is that you must use appropriate methods of analysis. It doesn't make sense if you are doing a qualitative study or a qualitative research and then in your analysis you are doing quantitative analysis. If you are asking people uh, questions of yes or no answer, which we normally classify as the nominal uh, scale of data, then it is important that you can only subject those types of analysis into either frequencies or percentages. Because there are only two options, yes or no. And Further to that, if you are using, for example, uh, measurement scales, like the Likert scales, and you are asking whether they disagree or disagree, and you are using maybe a three-point Likert scale or five-point Likert scale or a seven-point Likert scale, then you should also be very clear in terms of what type of analysis are you going to use so that you can be able to bring out the actual meaning from that analysis. So adequate analysis is very important so that you can arrive at the decision that will be agreeable to either other researchers or the consumer of your output. We will discuss more on that when we come to data analysis in Chapter 3. Uh, the other important thing that your research should subscribe to is that your findings should be logically analyzed. I think I started by saying that one of the basic principles or one of the basic qualities of a good research earlier on is that you must be very logical. And logic in philosophy is simply starting from the known to the unknown. So it is important to always introduce your reader to the existence of a particular problem in a manner that they can understand and they can be able also to agree with you. And that is why you'll find that there are different levels of presentations. So you'll have to present your concept at a particular panel. If you are clear, you go to another panel like that. And even when you come from the field, you still have to convince somebody that actually what you've collected, analyzed, and presented is, was done well. It followed a particular process that is a scientific process and that your findings are valid. 
Uh, least but not last, uh, on that subject of the qualities of a good research, is that your findings should always be presented and discussed unambiguously. I always insist that it is important to present your findings objectively. If you have three, four, five objectives, then why don't you discuss those findings in that particular order? Because one, you will be logical and you will be systematic. And even the reader will be able to follow your work right from the background to your objectives, to your research questions or hypotheses if you're using or, combi or you're combining both. Researcher review all the way up to when you are presenting your findings and conclusions. And therefore, it should be unambiguous in terms of either the reader understanding what you're presenting and also it should be in a simplified manner that the reader can understand what you are trying to argue or discuss even when you are going to discuss your findings because you'll have to compare what you found from the field and what other people or what other researchers have also found uh, in the field. Lastly again on that L, uh, section of the qualities of a good research is that your conclusion should be justified and based on empirical findings. So avoid as much as possible making unfounded justification and conclusions based on your own thinking. Most often you find pockets of those cases where you are making recommendations and conclusions not on your data, but you are making it on what you know or what you think. So what I'm simply saying is that in research, everything must be empirically supported or it must be factual. So either you're using data or you're using a reference that anybody can always refer to that reference and agree with you that what you've met is actually justified in terms of what uh, you're presenting, whether there is some data that backs up that evidence or that conclusion or that recommendation and so forth. So at all costs, try to avoid the temptation of making your own conclusions. Because one, this normally occurs, especially for people who maybe work in that particular industry. So in as much as you know that something may be happening or happening, does not allow you room to give that or provide that as evidence because it's only you who knows that. But something that is available either in literature or in statistics in terms of data can be used to support your findings or maybe agree or disagree with fi your findings. Our next discussion for today is we also uh, draw or maybe come to the end of our presentation is that what are you supposed to do when you want to choose a research topic? So I've already mentioned uh, what research is, what it entails, what are the characteristics and the tenets of this research, what are the qualities of a good research uh, process, but now we also need to understand what qualifies a good research title and I'm referencing that uh, with regards to a good research title in academia. Now, when we come to this point of choosing a research topic, uh, please don't forget that what precedes any research process is the research problem. So if your research problem is not there or if your research problem is not well articulated and is not supported, then there is no reason or there is no uh, basis for you to proceed with that particular kind of research. So it is important that even when you are allocated supervisors to guide you in your research process, then that does not limit you, or I would say that you are not limited to the research supervisor alone, but you can always console experts, you can console fellow colleagues, other students, or maybe, uh, maybe for example, your workmates or colleagues, and just have a discussion around your research topic. Chances are they might lend some evidence or credence to your research title. They will be able to help you or maybe shape your research title. However, Allow me also to put a caveat and say that the research topic that you determine at the point of inception for your research process is not the final. A research title or topic can always be reviewed even until that point that you are supposed just to graduate. So what that, that means is that you should not dwell so much on your research title. What is important is the gist that is there in the body of your research. Research problem is very important. Your objectives are very important because it will guide your study. Your background is very important because it introduces the problem 
and enables the reader to understand where you're coming from and maybe point out where you're going. So the recite title is not a big issue for now. However, it is important that we just understand today how you can go about using uh, interesting uh, and a researchable research title, which is the product of your research problem. So number one is that you need to always pursue a research endeavor in your area of interest. There is no need for you choosing an area of interest that you yourself you do not even like or you have no idea or maybe you have very little information about that. However, you can always pursue that kind of research, but it is always cardinal that you choose a topic that interests you. A topic that when you sit down, you feel like reading more about it and understanding. A title that when you walk, you're thinking about discovering something new. So it should be of interest to you. Put it this way. If it is not of interest to you, how will it be of interest to the reader or the consumer of your research, your, your research project? So you must first of all like, or put it this way, you must love your research topic, you must like it, you must, it must interest you, it must psych you, so that even the reader can see uh, uh, what you are trying to present or what you are trying to pursue. Secondly is that it is always important to choose a research title that is in your area of study. Uh, for the students who are doing masters uh, in the school of business, I would say that most of us who do, uh, who specialize, for example, in banking and finance, in human resource, in supplies and procurement, in project management, there is no point of you choosing a topic in human resource, whereas you are doing strategic management. So the alignment of your area of specialization or interest or study should always be or should always inform your research title. So it is important that your research title must also align to the course or program and the subject matter that you are studying. Number three is that there must be enough resources to inform you more or to tell you more about your research. Uh, when we come to that, uh, item number five, uh, is that you need to avoid controversial or trivial topics. I'll give you examples of such topics. And I'm tying that point with point number three, that you, your research title should enable you to access a rich resource of information and material. The reason why we are saying that is that there are those, uh, there are those research topics that either they're very new, talk for example maybe a topic like transgender, and you want to pursue a topic in that area where not many people have done research on. So chances are when you go to the field to collect information about that area, you will find either little or none. And therefore, you cannot proceed with that type of study unless now you are doing a basic research so that you come up with something new and tell us this is existing. But knowing very well that most students in business do applied research maybe to a little extent action research, then it is important that you choose a topic that has very rich resource of material. Another word of caution is that it should also not be over research because a title that has been over research, like for example HIV AIDS. You go to the internet today and Google about HIV AIDS, you'll find that it is overly researched, like it has been exhausted. So in business, it is the same thing that Find a topic that has sufficient. So the key word here is sufficient. It should not be very little. It should also not be very much because very much information also simply implies that it is an overly researched topic. Number four is that it, has, it must be within the time frame. So you are a student and you are doing a project and project is supposed to last between three months or four months or maybe one semester. So you must choose a title that will enable you or will, will allow you that period of three months or four months to write your concept, present your find, uh, go to the field, collect data and come and present your findings within that short duration. So it, chances are for those students who are in business, your research title should always be on a very dynamic issue or a very dynamic problem so that you can go to the field, come back and present your findings within that particular period when that problem is still relevant. So it is important that you also choose a study that is within the recommended time for study. 
for those who are doing a thesis or maybe they're writing a thesis, then a thesis is normally one academic year. So you also need to choose a title or a research topic that will take you through that uh, 12 months. So what that means also in terms of the volume of your writing is that definitely this is not based on any premise, is that a research project should be very, should not be as bulky as a thesis for that matter. However, that is subject to debate, but considering the time element of three months and 12 months, it means that you have to do more for the thesis than what you do uh, for the research project. Uh, number five is that avoid controversial or trivial topics. I'll give you maybe one or two examples. Religion, for example. If you are doing research that maybe, for example, focuses or maybe addresses something in religion, then we normally consider them trivial or controversial topics because there are people who maybe do not want to reveal their religion, either because of uh, political reasons or maybe because of societal uh, reasons, or maybe if you are doing it in a country or a society where um, religion is a problem or is, a, is an issue, like for example, talk of Nigeria, where you have frequent fights between um, the Islam and, 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 the, and, and, and Christianity. So you may not be very comfortable to carry out that particular study objectively and successfully because we normally consider them as controversial. Another example of a contro uh, controversial or trivial topics is maybe topics to deal with gender or maybe topics that deal with race. Take, for example, the case of uh, the Black Matter movement uh, uh, in, in the U.S. So it is very difficult, for example, if you are conducting a study on maybe race because some people do not want, maybe would not want to be associated with race, but they would want to be associated with maybe a different quality. And therefore, it becomes a challenge for you as a researcher to successfully conduct that study and come out successful. So it is important to avoid some of those. I started also by mentioning about maybe cases to deal with transgender. So cases to do with transgender, the LGBT, and so forth. Chances are you might even know where they are, where they are based, and most probably whether they are willing even to support your cause for carrying out the research on them. Especially, for example, even in Africa where maybe uh, some of those cases are not well ingrained in the communities. And therefore, they are still considered maybe an abomination or maybe they are still considered not normal people in the society. So if you are going to carry out a study on such areas, then chances are you might face difficulties or challenges in collecting data. So that is it. And then lastly, avoid recycling of topics. Most often you find that most of the recycled titles that are presented are either recycled or either they are topics uh, that have been done overly and overly again, and therefore we normally say avoid them. Uh, lastly, uh, allow me to speak on contemporary issues facing academic research today. Uh, this uh, will bring uh, my presentation today to the end. So this is a very simplified, uh, this is a simplified presentation in terms of what challenges are facing uh, research today, especially academic writing. And it's as simple as cost. Uh, there is money involved. There's a lot of traveling. Consider, for example, now that the fuel uh, prices have gone up. So you have to travel, go and collect data. You have to travel, uh, maybe involve research assistants. So there's always the element of cost, which is, just, which is a challenge, especially for a student. Secondly, is that there's also the element of time. So you have to fight within a particular space of time so that you can complete your study. Thirdly, you might also encounter language barriers, especially when you're conducting your study in an area where you do not know the local language. And maybe for some reasons, maybe they do not know to, uh, they are not, uh, the, the respondents you're targeting are not in a position maybe to converse either in Swahili or the English language. The other challenge is also the geographical coverage. What scope are you trying to focus on? So if you're focusing on, a, maybe for example, Nairobi County, for example, and you want to uh, collect data from the entire county, then there's the element of geography uh, in terms of how will you reach uh, those different places, how will you access them, uh, given the element of time and also cost. Uh, fifthly is that there's also the availability of relevant literature. So 
as I said earlier, uh, it is important that you always ensure that you choose a topic that uh, will enable you to access adequate material or sufficient literature that can inform you. And then lastly is also you have to fight with government regulations. So usually as you go to the field to collect data, you'll find that you have to always focus on government regulations in the sense that you have to always seek permission, you always have to be given permission to go ahead and collect data. And maybe because of sensitivity of some information, some institutions may refuse to maybe give you permission. And therefore, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our part one. And our next uh, lesson, uh, we will look at the research problem. Thank you for listening.